Merry Christmas, and welcome to Gospel Preaching. I'm Dave Rigg, coming to you from my home about six miles north of Albion, Illinois. My scripture for this Christmas message today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, and one verse, verse 21. From the New King James translation of the original Greek text, we read, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Would you pause just a moment with me for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come asking for your blessing on the reading of the Holy Word. And I pray, Lord, now for the guidance of the Holy Spirit that I might deliver this message today as you want it to be spoken. And I pray, Lord, that the hearts and the minds of all who watch this might be opened, each person, to receive from this message today what you have for them. This I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. The title of my message to you today is The Ugliness of Christmas. Hmm. Now, I know that probably sounds very unusual for you. Because we know that Christmas is a time when we see beautiful Christmas trees. Mine is just over here to my right. and It's all decorated up with, uh, well, uh, ornaments and uh, pretty lights on there. Uh, we have uh, pretty decorations all around our houses, most of us anyway. There are candles and wreaths and lots of wrapped presents underneath the tree by now. Everything is bright and, and cheery and happy, right? The Christmas cards that you might get in the mail, well, uh, they're lovely too. A lot of beautiful scenes in these Christmas cards. That's one side of Christmas. But the truth is, there's also another side. In fact, there's a very ugly side. The first Christmas was nothing like our Christmases today. It's really hard for me to believe that Mary and Joseph were filled with joy when they arrived in the city of Bethlehem. They had just finished a long, hard journey of approximately 97 miles from their home way up in Nazareth all the way down to the little city of Bethlehem. Now, by car today, we, we can make that journey in, well, about two hours or so, depending on how fast you drive. And we sit in our comfortable cars and listen to the radio, and it's really not that much of a deal for us to make that kind of a journey today. But you see, Joseph and Mary walked that distance, and it would have taken them approximately five days to make that journey. So they arrive in Bethlehem, and nobody, the Bible tells us, is willing to give them a place to stay. The inns are all full. So, the Bible tells us, they end up in a stable, perhaps with cows, horses, donkeys, sheep, who knows what. It was a stable. And that's not a very sanitary place to give birth to a baby. Standing there in the filth and the manure of a stable, those of us in the countryside who have been around the stables know what those things can be like. And there's another thing that we need to consider. Joseph and Mary are not at home. They are far away from home. Their family and friends, they're far away, way back up north in Nazareth. And suddenly, Mary begins to feel contractions. And she ultimately gives birth on a dark night. Now, you ladies who have given birth, know what it's like, especially that first birth. There isn't anything 
laughing about that when that happens. Right, ladies? Meanwhile, the Bible tells us there's the ugliness of a man by the name of King Herod. Now, history books tell us that Herod was a very ruthless man who liked the control and the power that he had because of his position as a king. And the Bible tells us that he ultimately orders the massacre of all the babies under two years old in that region. I, I, I will go this far to say this. There, there must have been some joy after Jesus was born. But the truth is, Christmas does have some ugly aspects to it. So I believe that a proper understanding of Christmas, we must have a proper understanding of the ugliness of Christmas as well. And that's the purpose of this message today. Now, our scripture for today, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, all the words spoken there are to Joseph by an angel. And the angel is sent to Joseph after he finds out that the woman that he's going to marry, by the name of Mary, is pregnant. And he knows he hasn't been with this woman. If she's pregnant, it can't be my son or daughter. So I would say to you that there couldn't have been much joy in the heart of Joseph before that angel came to speak to him. He knows Mary's pregnant. And he's so upset, the Bible tells us that before this angel shows up, Joseph is seriously considering divorcing Mary. Now, what about Mary? Yes, she was told that she was going to give birth to the Son of God. But remember this, back in those days, being unmarried and pregnant was a disgrace, unlike how things are today. Because you see, especially for the Jewish people, any woman who ended up pregnant and was not married could have been stoned to death. And even if that wasn't going to happen, I am knowing how things are today, and I don't think they would have been much different back then, there must have been some ugly rumors going around about Mary as she begins to show that she's pregnant. And they all know she's not married. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 and 40 tell us, Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. So from this, we know that Mary has to leave home. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how the parents of Joseph and Mary, uh, how they reacted to all this. And we don't know if their parents were still alive when Mary is conceived. But if they were, they didn't give Joseph and Mary any encouragement and support because I believe if that had been true, the Bible would have told us that. And I think there's another clue to the fact that there might not have been any parental support for Mary and Joseph because the Bible tells us there in Luke chapter 1 that Mary decides that the best thing she can do is go live with another relative for the nine months that she carries this baby. So Mary basically has to go away to have the Christ child. You see, again, friends, there really wasn't much joy before Jesus was born. Now, I hope as Christmas Day is approaching, that you already have joy in your heart. If you don't, I hope that before Christmas Day gets here, you will ultimately experience the joy of Christmas. But again, there really isn't much joy in the hearts of many people 
I have to confess that I really have to struggle at this time of year because I dearly miss my dear wife, Pat. And Christmas just hasn't been the same since her death back in 2017. Because you see, my dear wife, Pat, used to decorate our house up for Christmas in a grand style. Of course, we would put up a Christmas tree and we would go shopping for Christmas presents before Christmas. But none of that has been happening since her death. Now, I do have a little Christmas tree put up now, but it's about a third the size of the Christmas tree that Pat and I used to put up. And it certainly doesn't have all of the ornaments that we used to have on that tree. But I know this, there are many others who struggle at Christmas time. But that's not the ugliness of Christmas that I want to preach on here today. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You see, friends, the ugly side of Christmas is a three-letter word, S-I-N, sin. And the heart of Christmas is this big truth. Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And in fact, that was the message that was given to Joseph. Let me read it to you again. You shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. You see, friends, sin is what damns every soul to hell. Sin is spread throughout the entire world. And because of sin, there are tears and there are feelings of pain. Yes, even at Christmas time. There are wars and fighting. Seems like you can't uh, hear the news or read the news without being told of conflicts going on somewhere in our world. There are worries and certainly disagreements. There is fear and lost sleep by some people because of the struggles that they are going through or perhaps the struggles of loved ones that they are experiencing. There is sickness and, yes, even death. All those things go on at Christmas time. It, it doesn't stop, does it? All these ugly things in this world today, they don't stop when the calendar turns to December. So sin disturbs and disrupts every human relationship between people and relationships with God. We are much more prone to excuse sin than to try to examine it. So it's appropriate that at this time of year, when we could cover sin with all the beautiful things of Christmas, that we instead, for just a moment right now, reveal the ugliness that is behind all of this. You see, the reason that Jesus was born was to be the Savior, the one who came to deliver us from the ugliness of sin. You see, if there was no sin, there would be no need for a Christmas. It is sin, my friends, that generates death, heart disease, cancer, or wars, or murders, or accidents, or tragedies, such as the ones that we experienced here just a few days ago. It is sin that brings on old age, or whatever else that can be very unpleasant for us. The Bible says, the wages of sin is death. Every person on this earth has been affected by sin. Every person 
unless Jesus comes back first, is going to eventually die. So, Jesus came into this world to save us from our sin. And that, my friends, was the main purpose for his coming. Yes, it is sin that truly is the ugliness of Christmas. Every broken marriage, every disrupted home, every shattered friendship, every argument, every disagreement, every evil thought, every harsh word, every evil deed, divisions in the family, or divisions that sometimes pop up in our churches, all of these things can, attribute, can be attributed to that three-letter word, sin. So you see, we cannot look at Christmas and celebrate it without first dealing with why there really is a Christmas. Now, I want us to face five questions here today regarding sin. Here's question number one. What is sin? Well, we have to go to the Bible for a good definition, and we find it in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So sin is breaking God's law or any violation of God's law. That's what sin is. Lawlessness equals sin. It is living as if there is no God and no law for us to be observing and keeping. No authority, no standards of what is right and wrong. And we see in this world that you and I live in today, there is a great push for us all to be politically correct. No, no, my friends. To be politically correct is lawlessness. It's sin. Because, you see, in effect, it denies the reality of God's law. It says that God is not in charge and cannot put on us any binding rules. It is living beyond the boundaries that God has set down for us, which we find within the pages of the Bible. It is thinking that what is unacceptable to God, speaking what is unacceptable to God, and behavior that is unacceptable to God is no longer necessary for us to be considerate of. The fact of the matter is that most people have a desire to run their own lives and do what they want and do whatever pleases them. And they deny that God has a rightful place in their lives. Now we can look through the Bible and find many different kinds of sin and how those sins are ultimately committed. But the simplest definition of sin is that it is a violation of God's law. Question number two, what is sin like? What is sin like? What are the characteristics of sin? Well, sin, God's word says, is defiling. It is a contamination. It is like scars on a lovely face or stains on a shirt or blouse. It makes the soul red with guilt and black with evil. In Zechariah chapter 3, verse 3, sin there is compared to filthy garments. You see, sin pollutes and defiles and stains and mars everything that it touches. And the sad fact is, it touches everything in a human being. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 calls it filthiness of the flesh and spirit. You see, friends, it is sin 
that drove those nails in the hands of Jesus. It is sin that placed a crown of thorns on his head. It is sin that jammed a spear into his side. It is sin that spits on him. It is sin that mocked him. Question number three, what causes sin? What causes it? Let's go to the Bible. Acts 17, 28 says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. I would say this, sin is ingratitude. See, without Jesus, you, you really wouldn't be here today, and neither would I. You, my friends, were created by Jesus, and so was I. And so, as the Bible says, you live and you breathe because Jesus made you. Whatever in the world that you might possess, and whatever it is in this world that you enjoy, you have it because of Jesus. Jesus has blessed us with his favor. Matthew 5, 45 says, For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good too, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You see, it is Jesus who provides all the food that even the sinners eat. Every beautiful scene that you've ever seen, every good feeling that you've ever felt, Jesus gave that to you. It is Jesus who made love. It is Jesus who made laughter. It is Jesus who gives us the joys of life. It is Jesus who gives each person special skills and each person what makes him or her who they are. Jesus surrounds, as the Bible says, even the ungrateful sinner with his care even though they continue in sin. Sin causes us to be ungrateful and then even want more. Let's move on to question number four. How many people does sin affect? That's a good question, isn't it? How many people does sin affect? The answer is found in the book of Romans. Chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very clear in the book of Genesis that sin came into this world through Adam and has passed down through all of mankind since that time in the Garden of Eden. 1 John 3, 5 says, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So the only person that has ever walked this earth is Jesus Christ. He was not a sinner. Original sin in Adam contaminated the entire human race. Yeah, even people who go to church every Sunday. These people, many times, they get offended if you would call him or her a sinner. They don't like to think of themselves with that term. Well, let me ask you this question. Have you ever been sick? <laughs> Here's another question. Are you getting older? And will you eventually die? <laughs> well, the answer to all those questions is obviously yes. And friends, sin is the reason. And you, in spite of how you might try to want to deny it, you can't. You can't deny that you are a sinner. Sin remains a problem for even the faithful Christian people. All of us, all of us are affected by it. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let's move on to my last question. Question number five, what does sin cause? And this is a big question. What does sin cause? 
In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 17, God's word says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So from Scripture, we can draw this conclusion. Sin has dominated our minds so that the thinking process is overpowered with evil. Our minds think evil. Our minds sometimes plan evil. Sometimes our minds conceive of evil deeds. People tend to love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Their loves, their affections, their wishes, their wants, their desires, all toward those things which are not right. So man is overpowered by evil. Sin is the nature even of every Christian man, woman, boy, and girl. It is the essence of a Christian. Sin brings us under the dominance of Satan himself. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. And friends, if you don't already know this, you need to understand this. Satan is at work even in this day and age and perhaps even more so than he ever has been before. Sin overpowers us and brings us under the control of Satan himself. Sin also subjects, subjects a person to all the miseries of life. And sin brings the worst of all there ever is in the life of an individual person. Job chapter 5 verse 7 says, Man is born into trouble, and trouble becomes his name. And we know that trouble is everywhere around us. We live a life of sin, and as a result, we get troubles in this life. Listen, my friends, it is sin that brings the worst things into our lives. It exposes us to all the ultimate miseries of life. And the final result of sin is that it damns people to hell. Millions of people all over the world have died this very past year. And more of them will be dying in the new year to come for sure. And the sad fact is that hell awaits the vast majority of people who will die in this coming year. In closing, I would say this. Some of you may have been thinking all along, why in the world is Brother Dave preaching this kind of a sermon at Christmas time? And why would he want to preach on the ugliness of Christmas? Because this, my friends, it is, in fact, the ugliness of Christmas that brings us to the point of its beauty. The beauty of Christmas is that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, isn't that the beauty of Christmas? How can we really understand the beauty of Christmas without, in fact, seeing the ugliness of Christmas as well. God determined to send his only begotten sin into this world for the purpose of dying for us. That's Christmas. That's the meaning of Christmas. No matter what warm feelings you might have about Christmas now, 
unless you understand the ugliness of your own sin and embrace Jesus Christ, who alone can save you from that sin, then, friend, you don't have any connection with Christmas. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity you've given me to come each week here on Facebook and on YouTube with these messages you lay upon my heart. I pray, Lord, now as this message, the ugliness of Christmas goes out all over the world, that you will use it as only you can to touch the hearts and the minds of people who watch and that you will do your magnificent work in their lives. This I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Well, thank you for watching Gospel Preaching today. I hope that you are experiencing the joy of Christmas, but I hope maybe this message today will help you also to understand the ugliness and the reason why we really have a Christmas in the first place. And I hope that you're going to have a very beautiful and happy Christmas this year. And I hope you'll make plans to join me again next week at this same time for another message from God's Word here on Gospel Preaching. In addition to wishing you a Merry Christmas, my prayer is that God will richly bless you.